Right. I've entitled this talk, Paul in Corinth, what exactly did he see and how did he see it? And basically what I've tried to do is reconstruct Paul's journey to and through the city of Corinth as recorded in Acts 18 in an attempt to try to see things through his eyes and as he would have experienced them. Now, I'll be drawing on the research of various scholars who have tried to do just that, give a blow-by-blow -blow account of Paul's experiences in the region of Corinth, uh, based on what we know from archaeology and history. And in the second part of the talk, uh, we'll be looking at how Corinth and its culture comes out, in that is how it impacts upon Paul's two letters to the church in Corinth, uh, that is 1 and 2 Corinthians uh, in the New Testament canon. So hopefully by the end of the talk we'll be in a better position to grasp something of the essence and culture of the Corinth of 50-51 AD, which is the period we're looking at, and therefore something of what made the average Corinthian tick, and by extension something of what made the average uh, Corinthian Christian tick. So first of all, first things first, let's establish a scriptural basis for what we're talking about. Now Paul's 18 months is one and a half years in Corinth is covered in the book of Acts chapter 18 verses 1 to 19 and we're just going to look at a, uh, an abridged version of that uh, there on the screen. Uh, Acts 18 from verse 1. After this Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. Right, and looking at the next picture there, now that is a modern reconstruction of ancient Corinth. I actually seem to think this picture is more from the 2nd century AD, a bit after Paul got there, but uh, nonetheless, if you just take this image and fix it in your mind for the duration of the talk. Now, this is something like the world that Paul would have experienced, that is the world where he would have uh, worked and lived and ministered for the 18 months of his life that uh, he stayed here in Corinth. And looking at it, it's a typical uh, Greco-Roman city, very Mediterranean. Look, you've got the, ch the chalk white facades, the columns, the colonnades, the very officious uh, square Roman grid plan uh, structure, uh, the red tile roofs and so forth. And if we picture this sort of thing in our minds, whenever we read Acts 18, Paul in Corinth, or uh, indeed Paul's letters to uh, the Corinthians, uh, we're pretty much, pretty much on, on the right track. Right, first of all, a few basics. At the time of Paul's first visit to Corinth, as I said earlier, it estimated around 50, 51 AD. Uh, different experts have different opinions, differ slightly, but if you look at 50, 51, uh, you're roughly on the right track. So to put that in some kind of perspective, the church in general has only been around about 20 years. That is the day of Pentecost, the mighty day of Pentecost that birthed the church, Some occurred some 20 years before. Uh, Christianity is still a very new religion, but it's beginning to blossom, it's beginning to flourish, and beginning to turn heads in throughout the Roman Empire, uh, some, uh, some positive and uh, some, some very suspicious uh, attitudes, some very uh, suspicious attitudes to the new religion. As far as Paul himself is concerned, we must picture him as probably somewhere in his mid-40s, uh, Experts, nobody knows for sure, obviously, but uh, it's generally presumed that Paul was born somewhere between 1 and 10 AD. Uh, by comparison, Jesus born 4 BC. So uh, while Jesus and Paul were alive, we can picture Paul as a bit younger than, than Jesus. Of course, there's no evidence that, that they ever actually met, but uh, nonetheless, if we can just see that as a basic, basic age difference to give us uh, some idea. Now, furthermore, it's only been 15 years since Paul's dramatic encounter and vision on the road to Damascus. 
Uh, that is, Paul has only been a Christian about 15 years by the time he uh, arrives in Corinth. Uh, as far as the visit to Corinth is concerned, it takes place in what is termed Paul's second missionary journey. Paul made three missionary journeys altogether. Uh, and in all, he tended to focus on two main areas, Greece, where he is now, and then the area called Asia Minor, which is a bit to the east, Asia Minor, which roughly corresponds with uh, modern-day Turkey, uh, bearing in mind, of course, that uh, Paul is from Asia Minor initially. We know him as Paul of Tarsus. He's born in Tarsus, which is a city right on the southern point of Asia Minor, that is, uh, the southern point of modern-day Turkey. So Greece and Asia Minor, then, the two main areas that Paul is concerned with, his two main mission mission areas, the two main areas on earth that he has a very real heart for. As far as time span is concerned, as I said earlier, uh, according to Acts 18.11, Paul spends 18 months here in Corinth. And that means that we can put Paul's stay there very roughly at somewhere between 50 and 53 AD. Again, different experts differing as to exact dates, but uh, 50 to 53, and you're about on the right uh, track. As far as immediate background is concerned, Paul has just come down from Athens, which uh, is situated about 83 uh, kilometers to the east, and we'll look at that a little bit later. So then, Acts chapter 17 tells of Paul and Thessalonica and Athens, and uh, chapter 18, uh, if you look on a map, you can, you can trace the uh, movement of Paul's second missionary journey. Acts chapter 18, he moves further westward and uh, hops across 83 kilometers to the west to the city of, of Corinth. Right, we're now going to look at uh, Corinth, a brief history. Uh, somebody has, has uh, termed it Corinth, the tale of two cities. And when we look at it, the history of Corinth can be divided into two parts. First of all, before 146 BC, and second of all, after 44 BC. And as we'll see, it is literally a tale of two cities. What's so special about these two dates? Uh, well, in 146 BC, the uh, terrible Roman general Mummius uh, flattened the city of Corinth, moved into it, uh, wiped it out, and so poor old Corinth spent the next hundred years or so as a burnt-out hovel. But in 44 BC, the great Julius Caesar, only a few months before his assassination, gave a decree that Corinth should be built up again. And so he sent several freedmen, several ex-slaves, uh, a freedman is a slave who has, who has uh, received his, his freedom to do the job of re-establishing and building up the city. That's 44 BC, and to all accounts, they did a very good job. In only a few short generations, Corinth had become what we today would call a boom town. Very soon it had started to blossom, and it started to flourish, and it soon became apparent that it was possible to do very well for oneself in Corinth. Why was this? Well, perhaps most important, the city found itself on several major crossroads in the Roman Empire. And going to the next picture here, first of all, the west-east crossroads. Now, looking at the map, forget about the inset on the left. If you start at the centre of the map and drift eastwards a bit, you will find the city of Corinth, where it's all happening. And the black dot of Corinth, if you um, then go in a northeasterly direction from that, you will find a dotted line moving across the thin neck of land. That dotted line is important. We're going to get into it a bit later. And uh, there are two big striped areas on either side of the dotted line. The two striped areas are the west and east parts of the Mediterranean Sea. And the thin strip of the dotted line between them is a narrow region of land called the Isthmus. And I use the word neck specifically because the word Isthmus means neck in Greece, in, in Greek, and that is exactly what it was, a thin neck of land that separated mainland Greece from the southern part, which is called the Peloponnese. And as we can see, Corinth was just south of that, uh, that Isthmus, Isthmus spelled I-S-T-H-M-U-S, -S, Isthmus, the Greek word for neck, and Corinth just south of that Isthmus, and just into this Peloponnese region. So, Greece therefore marks the distinction uh, between the western and eastern Mediterranean, and uh, in a narrower sense, as we can see, Corinth is Greece's main port for those wishing to travel 
from the west part to the east part of the uh, Mediterranean, or indeed from east to west. So Corinth, the main city that controls and oversees that important isthmus neck of land, and you can be sure that Corinth milked the trade from those that wished to travel across the isthmus going from, from one to the other. Uh, you might ask yourself why people just didn't take their boats and sail all the way down around the uh, Peloponnese to the eastern part of the Mediterranean. The answer to that is very simple, uh, because it was a very treacherous part of the world. There were many, many rocks, many ships were lost, and people figured that it would be a lot safer uh, just to hop across from, from one side uh, to the other instead of, of risking all that all that damage. Now, as you can see on the map, uh, if you go back to Corinth and you go just above it, you can see a little place, a little port just on the Mediterranean called Lycaeum. And uh, if you move to the right, to the east of Corinth, you'll see another another port just on the Mediterranean called Kenkra. Now, Lycaeum and Kenkra were Corinth's two main ports. Lycaeum on the west uh, took in and dealt with all the juicy trade uh, coming in and going out to and from Italy and Rome, and Cenchreae, on the other hand, on the east side, dealt with all the trade coming, uh, going to and from Asia Minor in the east, so west or east, uh, Corinth had you pegged, and you can be sure that it took full advantage of the lucrative trade and traffic uh, moving in and out on a constant basis. Right, so much for east to west, in terms of north and south, Corinth also held a monopoly as we saw, Corinth is right on this thin isthmus, which is the only thing connecting mainland Greece and the southern Peloponnese part, and Corinth the most important city, not only for those wanting to travel from west to east, but also from the, for those wanting to travel from north to south. So whether you wanted to go west to east or north to south, Corinth, Corinth had a monopoly, had you pegged, and you can be sure that Corinth was going to impose tolls, it was going to use its sizable resources at a price, to make sure it milked that pivotal part of the Roman Empire. So Corinth then is a very important commercial centre wherever you were headed in that part of the world, that, um, that important eastern part of the Roman Empire. The famed scholar Jerome O'Connor calls it, quote, one of the great crossroads of the ancient world. And uh, the famous second century AD uh, orator, a man called Aelius Aristides, and we're going to look at him a little bit later, he said of Corinth, it receives all cities and sends them off again, and is a common refuge for all, like a kind of route or passage for all mankind, no matter where one would travel, and it is a common city for all Greeks, indeed, as it were, a kind of metropolis and mother in this regard. So according to the uh, pontificating Aelius Aristides, calls it a, a mother city, uh, and one gets in the impression of Corinth as a, a central access point for, uh, for many peoples and for much trade and traffic. And so we have Corinth, 44 BC, it's just a room with a few scattered inhabitants probably living in tents, but in less than a hundred years, the time that Paul gets there, it has a population of somewhere between 40,000 and 100,000 people. Um, again, experts differ uh, quite widely as to the population of, of Corinth. Uh, some have it as, as low as 12,000, others have it as high as 160,000. But if you stick somewhere between 40 and 100,000 people, uh, you're probably uh, in, the right, in the right 